بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي First of all, I praise Almighty Allah. I praise the Creator, the Sustainer, the Cherisher of the worlds for giving me and you another chance to come back to Him. We strayed away from the path. We committed mistakes, offenses, and sins, sometimes major, sometimes minor, sometimes overt, sometimes secret, sometimes in terms of whisperings of thoughts, dirty thoughts. And we may have glanced dirty scenes in the Facebook, chatting rooms and things like that, na'udhu billah. So how do we clean ourselves? Do we have another chance? The answer is yes. Here is Ramadan, the month of redemption, the month of expiation, the month of washing clean, the month described as, it's reported by Rasulullah from Rasulullah, awwaluhul rahma wa awsatuhul maghfira wa akhiruhul ituku min al-nar. The first part of Ramadan is our days of mercy. The middle part is days of forgiveness. And the last 10 days are days of freedom from hellfire. Now, I need to apologize. I speak better when I am extambor, spontaneous. But in this case today, I had to prepare my talk. I had to write it down because we have to take into account the needs of the hearing impaired, our brothers and sisters. We need somebody to translate because some of these terms may not be familiar with ev for, for everyone. So I, did, I needed to write it down, so I am bound by the text. But the words I spoke spontaneously, they were not given to them. So maybe they were perplexed. Are you perplexed? You are OK, inshallah. OK. Let's thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me and you this opportunity to witness another blessed month of Ramadan. Month of Ramadan is Sayyid al-Shuhur. It's the greatest, the most blessed month in the Islamic calendar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to send down the first piece of revelation to Muhammad bin Abdullah, the seal of prophets, in the blessed month of Ramadan. We know Allah is all wise, all knowing. So he chose the month of Ramadan to begin that process of revelation to Muhammad bin Abdullah as he was sitting in meditation, in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah in the cave Hira. So, and we are told in the Quran, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month in which Allah sent down the Quran as a revelation to his messenger. Hudan lil nas ubayyinati min al-huda wal-furqan with guidance for mankind and clear signs of guidance and criterion to distinguish the truth from falsehood. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَالْيَسُمُ So we need to commemorate this month. And of course, by fasting. And of course, fasting has manifold benefits. And the primary purpose of fasting, function of fasting is to nurture taqwa Allah, mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is the key to salvation. So, in this talk, I am going to reflect 
on the significance of the Quranic revelation and how do we apply the lessons to our life? There is no question, there is no doubt that Muslims in general today, even though we are more than 1.6 billion in the world, by many standards, we occupy the bottom. This is in spite of the fact that the Quranic revelation came to revive a dead nation. It educated them, it trained them, it mentored them to be leaders of humanity, to change the course of history. And we did that through the power of the Quran for more than 1,000 years. The history of Islam is described as the majestic Majestic is the most glorious period in the history of mankind. But unfortunately today, we do have the same Quran, but we have occupied the bottom. There is no way for us to go any further down. The only way up is up. We need to go move up. How do we do that? Of course, it is my firm conviction based on my understanding of Islam, which spanned a lifetime from the age 10 until today. I consider myself a lifelong student of Islam and the Quran and the Hadith and the Fiqh and Tasawwuf. And I have no doubt in my mind that the only way Muslims can change themselves, transform ourselves, and return to that state of glory and majesty that God has promised us and God delivered it for us is by coming back to the Quran. So in this short lecture, I'm going to ask the question, what is the message of the Quran? What is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this revelation want to teach us? He's expecting from us and number two, how do we benefit from the Quran? How do we benefit from that message that Allah wanted to convey through this revelation? And number three, inshallah, I'm going to explain briefly some of the traits. The Quran is full of traits, profile of the true servants of Allah who have realized the best of the potential. So, by reflecting on this, inshallah, we can change our condition, inshallah. First of all, the question, what is the message of the Quran? The Quran has explained it in numerous places. Because of the short time, I want to give you a single ayah. Two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the message of the Quran is meant to guide us to the straight path, to the most upright path. And through this message, Allah has promised us felicity in both worlds. There has come to you light from your God, from Allah. And a clear book. By means of which, God guides those who choose to follow his pleasure unto the ways of peace and harmony and balance. And take them out of shadows unto light by his leave. And guide them unto the straight path. So it's very, very clear. In another place, Allah said, Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi lillati hiya qawam. Verily, this Qur'an leads mankind to the most upright path. The path that helps mankind to realize to be peak performers. Psychology has this term, peak performance. Realizing the best of human potential. But you know, because of their secular, myopic, one-dimensional 
view of reality, they confine everything to the physical, to the sensible. But in Islamic terminology, we have a deeper a soul within, which is not, which cannot be accessed by psychology. It has to be explained to us through the revelation. And Allah wants us to know that this Quran helps human beings to realize their best potential, physically, intellectually, and spiritually. So once we follow this guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you become a peak performer. And of course, who are those peak performers of humanity? The best role models for us, they are the prophets, the mighty messengers of Allah, who changed history, who still remembered and cherished. Their memory is fondly cherished by human beings in every part of the world. So, so when the Quran was revealed for us to ponder and reflect, to study the lessons. Once we understand this message, as Imam Ghazali said, Quran requires from us that we need to articulate the speech. You mean read it as we should read it. Articulate the sound. And then the next stage is understand, use the mind to understand what you are reading. And then the next step is to act upon it. Once we do that, a transformation takes place, a change within. A consciousness is changed. So, and then your action follow accordingly, your speech follows accordingly. So, the Quran is supposed to educate the mind. It's supposed to change our consciousness. It is supposed to ennoble the spirit, our soul. As an example, I will take you to the essence of the Quran. Of course, how many of us know the value of Fatiha? Which is the greatest surah in the Quran? Does anyone know? What is the greatest surah in the Quran? The greatest surah in the Quran is none other than Fatiha. Alam surah fil Quran, al Fatiha. Actually, Fatiha is called by many names, it's called the mother of the book, it's called the opening, it's called the asas, the foundation. It has many names. It is called the prayer par excellence. It's called the thanksgiving. It has many names, more than two dozen names. And of course, Fatiha summarizes the entire Quran for us. Allah is so merciful. Allah did not require me and you to read the entire Quran every day. But in place of that, he required from us that we must read Fatiha not once a day, minimum 17 times a day. If you are reading Sunnah and Nawafil, Sunan and Nawafil, and Tahajjud and whatnot, it may be a hundred times or more. This is called as Sabul Mathani, the seven most repeated most meditated upon verses of the Quran. The question why? Because it contains the essence of the Quran. All of the basic themes of the Quran in a capsule form is given to you in the Quran. If only we ponder it, if only we reflect it. Okay? The Prophet said, there is no valid prayer without recitation of Fatiha. It is required reading because it contains all of the basic themes of the Quran. The reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned us to mold ourselves in the mold of the Quran. Die ourselves in the die of the Quran. 
repeated reading and reflection will drill these central concepts into our consciousness. Psychologists say, you know, the affirmation that you make, the repeated affirmations you make changes you from within. So, Asabul Mathani is the most repeated meditation formula words in Islam. By repeating them, reflecting on the meaning, not just articulating the sound, reflecting the meaning is supposed to drill this basic concept into our consciousness. So what are the basic themes of the Fatiha that Quran expounds in greater detail? First of all, Fatiha gives us a noblest concept of God Almighty. It talks about God and man, God and the world. And the concept of God in Fatiha is so universal, so lofty, so noble, there is nothing like this in any of the scriptures of the world. The reason? Because Rasulullah is sent as the messenger, the last messenger to unite all of humanity. So the Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So these two verses is talking about God and his relationship with the world, relationship with man. And Fatiha introduces God Almighty as God of mercy. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, repeated twice. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. So God introduced Himself to us not as God of the Arabs or God of Muslims or God of a particular tribe or nation but God of all the worlds. al alamin visible and invisible worlds. And you cannot even imagine, visualize the size, immense magnitude of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And God tells us he is the creator, not only of this world, the earth, but all the worlds. Infinite immense, vast, and he is their sustainer, he is their cherisher, he is the Lord. And what is the relationship of God with his creation? The terms are based on mercy and compassion. It's not a tribal God. It is not a vindicative God, a God who is chasing you. He is God of mercy, God of compassion. And then, next comes, so the message here is a universal message intended to unite humanity. Second concept is the meaning and purpose of life. According to some psychologists, Carl Jung and others, you know this, there is this abnormal psychology, pathology, Freud and others, they studied pathologies, cases people who are not realizing the best of potential, a deviant, abnormal psychology. And then there is Carl Jung and others who studied people who believed in God Almighty and had a purpose and meaning in life. He said Freud should have studied them before making this theory. But anyway, I am not here to teach psychology or talk about it. But what we are saying here is, the, those who, who find no meaning in life, no purpose in life, there is no way for them to be free from anxiety. There is no way for them to feel that inner peace. It's only those who discover the meaning of life and connect themselves with the source of life, which is God Almighty, who can find meaning and purpose in life and peace in life. So that is the second theme in the Quran. What is, why am I here? Why am I here? Is this the end of life for me? I live here 70 years, 40 years, sometimes 20 years, or 100 years maximum, or 120, 
and when you reach 120, it's a newspaper story. Is that God says us no? This is a station you are passing through. The real life awaiting you in the next world. And there is judgment. There is reckoning. So Malik Yomiddin, master of the day of reckoning, master of the day of judgment. So when you read that, you are praying and you visualize that you are going to stand before God for judgment. So having said your prayer, you cannot go to that shopping mall and do business and cheat. Tell lie. I bought this for ten dollars. I am going to give you for that cost price, where you got it for five dollars. Lie, lie, lie. Muhammad Ali, you know, he sacrificed millions because he wanted to stand for the truth. Sacrifice millions, and you know there are people in order to cheat a person, defraud him by a thousand dollar. They try hard. We do it. Muslims do it. Others do it. So how can we pray and repeat to ourselves so many times, Maliki Omiddin, master of the day of judgment, and yet do that? It should remind us of our accountability. And then we are reminded that this world is not what you should aim for. How many of us waste our time? If we have 24 hours and wakeful hours is 12 hours, billah, after work we spend all the time beautifying this mansion. And we visualizing that we are going to stay here forever. Everybody knows you and I go into that hole. Whether you like it or not, I will be buried there, you will be buried there. And so, Prepare yourself. Prepare your home in the grave. Prepare your home in the next world. And that is the lesson of Maliki Omiddin. We are accountable for our actions. The next concept is acknowledgement of divine lordship and sovereignty. So you know God as the sovereign lord and the master of the universe. And he is all compassionate and merciful. And you, over, and you know that he is Maliki Yawmiddin. Then this is the God you should worship. So we say, Iyya kanabudu. You alone we worship. And from you alone we seek help. You see? Now, then we are calling upon God Almighty to guide us and to the straight path. Surat al Mustaqim, guide us unto the straight path, the path that will lead to felicity and happiness, the path that saves us from misery and perdition. God is the one to turn for guidance and help. And we can only be saved by the grace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know all of the ordinances all of the laws, all of the prescriptions in the Quran and in Islam are meant to bring benefit for us. To help us realize the best. And to save us from the evil inside me and you. Allah wants to save you and me from the evil within. So that we don't corrupt our soul. We don't destroy. We don't lose this chance to get to Jannah. You know, Muhammad Ali, I was told, I heard that speech by his wife. He said, every single day, this man used to tell his wife, I want to get to Jannah. I remembered his words. He said, as soon as, when he was planning for retirement, he used to say to himself, I want to be the best the evangelist for Islam, just like Billy Graham. But he said, God wanted otherwise, he gave me Parkinson's to teach me I am not the greatest. You see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides people? How many of us have this kind of thoughts? It, it tells us something 
about the cherished belief of this man who accomplished something great with his life. So, then we are saying, Surat al -Ladina, what kind of path Allah, we are asking Allah to guide us unto? Surat al namta alayhim, the path of those who have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This blessed souls, the prophets, the saints, the martyrs, the virtuous people, righteous people, those role models of humanity, those mentors of humanity, those who were peak performers, realized the fullness of their human potential. They are role models. People look up to them. So Allah, we are asking Allah to guide us unto the path of the righteous souls and then save us from the path of those who incur the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they know the truth, but they turn their back on the truth. Or just like in the secular agnostic academic milieu, they don't know, they say they don't know. And they will come to know. They don't know if there is God. They don't know there is hereafter. But they will come to know. But it will be too late. So we don't want to belong to either of these groups. Those who incur the wrath of Allah by turning their back to the truth after having known it because they don't practice it. They don't stand for truth. They want to test the truth and change it to suit their whims and fancies. Or those who prefer to grow up in darkness because they don't know and they don't want to know. Okay, so now the next point I'm going to discuss is how are we going to benefit from this revelation? First of all, I gave you a brief expose of Fatiha. Now how many of us have been reading Fatiha aware, awake to these dimensions of meaning? The answer would be, I could challenge and bring here hundreds of Uffas and ask them what are the central themes of Fatiha. I'm sure from my experience as an Imam, in three of the great mosques, I would say every one of them will fail that test. Maybe few, one percentage will pass that test, but others will fail the test. So did we succeed in teaching the Quran? The answer is no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do we benefit from the Quran? The answer is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says it was revealed for us to reflect upon the message. Afala yatadabbaroon al Quran, amala khulubin akfaluha. Don't they reflect on the Quran? Is it that the hearts are locked up? They have hearts, but they don't, they have mind they don't use. They have ears, they don't hear. They have eyes, they don't see. So, the Quran simply is recited by Muslims today. On the day of judgment, we are told, the messenger of Allah will present himself before Allah and say, and Quran says, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا And the messenger of Allah submitted before Allah saying, my people have abandoned the Quran. How is the Rasulullah saying when we have millions of Uffaz and Qurra competing with one another and we read the Quran day in and day out and yet Prophet is making the submission that my people neglected the Quran. They neglected the message of the Quran. They did not act upon it. Our approach to the Quran, the best way to understand it, one scholar puts it this way. He said, you have a garden. You are a rich man, suppose. I'm not a rich man. And I have a beautiful garden. I'm not rich. I'm just assuming now. And I hired a gardener to take care of this garden. And I have prepared a list of things to be done in the garden every day. Make sure you weed, fertilize, water, and you know, do everything so that this, these plants and trees grow well. This list prepared beautifully. He took it. He went to a corner. He reading it, chanting it melodiously from morning to evening. In the meantime, he did nothing 
He did not take care of the garden. And weeds have taken over the garden. And the plants are drying. Trees are dying. And in the evening he wants to claim his wages. Of course he will get his wages. And this is exactly what Muslims are doing today with the Quran. Of course this is, this was the thundering speeches of Hassan al-Basri. Ibn Masood radiallahu anhu said, Aksaru munafiqi hadhi al-umma qurra'uha. The majority of the hypocrites in this ummah are the Qurra. Who is saying that? Not Ahmad Kuti, Abdullah ibn Masood, radiallahu anhu said, majority of the munafiqin of this ummah would be the Quran reciters who don't act upon what they read. You understand? So, melodiously chanting the Quran is not going to benefit us. We need to Approach, change our approach to the Quran as a means of salvation. We must get to the message. The only way we can benefit from the Quran is as Dr. Iqbal, Allama Iqbal, the poet philosopher of Islam, he said, you know Iqbal, Rahmahullah, he used to read the Quran every day. And you know, he visualizes God is speaking direct to him through this Quran. Because he is visualizing that, every day he is reading the Quran, his Musaf is full of tears. And somebody has to take this Musaf to the sun so that it dries up. Because his heart is identifying with the revelation. Quran, Allah is speaking to me now through this Quran. So, Quran warned us to read this book in order to build the character. Now, I want to summarize, conclude this by pointing out some of the traits of the servants of the merciful so that by reflecting on these portraits repeatedly and trying to act upon them, we can, inshallah, benefit from the Quran. In Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is Surah number 25, verses 63 to 77, Allah described 10 characteristics of the servants of the merciful. They are called servants of the merciful. Did it occur to you to ask why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the believers as servants of the merciful? Number one, God is merciful. And number two, as Imam Ghazali said, because we believe in the God of mercy, you, you and I have to be instrument of mercy in the world. Transfer the mercy of God to the creation. They walk on earth meekly, humbly, because you know why? They know their position. They are created from the earth, and they must go to the earth. So I have no reason to be proud. The one created from the mud and going to the mud, I have no right to be proud. And they prostrate and pray to God. You know, Iblis refused to prostrate to Adam when Allah ordered him because he was proud. The root of our sins is pride. So cut out the pride. Before cutting out that pride, you cannot submit to God Almighty. That's why the next verse follows. And they prostrate to God. But cut out that pride first before you are eligible to prostrate. You see how Quran is relevant? And then, once we recognize that we prostrate to God and we know we are accountable for Him, there is heaven and hell. So guard yourself from fire of hell. God, ya Allah, protect us. Save us from hell fire. Inna adaba kana warama. Because the punishment, the torture, the chastisement of hellfire is painful. And number three, four, they are not wasteful. Unfortunately, today, Muslims are wasteful with everything. Look at this heart. People make fun when they say, oh, we need only one light. You know how much light was in the mosque of Rasulullah. Many of the great giants of Islamic civilization, they studied under candle lights or moonlight. Here you are flooding the masjid with the light, wasting the resources of the ummah. And the water is wasted. 
We use 800 liters of water for shower when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi used 3 liter water for his bathing. And yet we claim to be the followers of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Of course, so not wastage, not miserly also. And next thing is they do not call upon deities before Allah, beside Allah. You know the root of corruption in the world, the corruption, exploitation in all religions in the world. What is the root of it? People making go men like me and new gods and prostrating to them. This is the thing going on in India. There are thousands of god men and god women. They cheat, they defraud, they exploit. They exploit. And this is happening in other great religions as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved me and you by taking out this concept of intermediary that we can speak direct to Allah. We don't need to go through Imam to confess or pastor to confess. And number, next one, they do not kill. Killing innocent people is one of the greatest sin after shirk in Islam. And that is why those who kill right and left, killing themselves and killing others, they don't understand because when you kill one person, you have killed all of humanity. When you save one person, you have saved all of humanity because all the life is interconnected. You belong to him. He belongs to me. Nafsum wahida. And they do not fornicate. Lustful thoughts. Ramadan is here to teach us how to control these lustful thoughts. We cannot control unless we guard our eyes. But how can you do though? Cut down Facebook. Cut down internet chatting. Cut down all these, you know, all this, you know, ways in which you are seductively, unconsciously, you slip, you slip. You know, person is asking me this question again and again. I happened to go in this and then it led me to this. And then I fornicated. I did this, I did this. Now I am remorseful. First of all, guard your eyes, guard your ears, guard your mind, guard your hand, guard your speech. And they do not be a false testimony. Meaning what? A Muslim has to stand for the truth. But today, we are living in the years of deception. The truthful are falsified. And those who speak lies are called truthful. Sinina khadda'at. Truth is hidden, twisted. Media is flourishing by twisting the truth. Look at this in, in incident even. This man was a gay. He was frequenting gay bar more than three years. Now it is not reported in the New York Times. It's all because he's connected with ISIL. Now, Billah, because they do not give the full truth. They do not pass by God's signs heedlessly. Some others, they read the signs of God in the scripture and the nature and ponder and reflect. And they pray to God to grant them joy in their spouses and children. Brothers and sisters, I know people are looking at me. Let me conclude with one important story, little story. There was this sage called Ibrahim bin Adham. He is a master sage. He was passing through the streets of Basra. People gathered around him. Abu Ishaq, we have been praying to Allah all these years, but we don't seem to get any response. When I heard that, I said to myself, millions of prayers are rising from the Haramain, and yet we don't seem to get any response from Allah. Ibrahim bin Adham replied, because the prayers are coming from dead heart, your hearts are dead. Why? Number one, you read the Quran, but you don't act upon it. Number two, number two is you, you claim, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you don't fulfill your duties towards Allah. That is number one. Number two is you read the Quran, but don't act upon it. You claim to love the messenger of Allah, but you don't follow the sunnah. But we take the easiest sunnah, take a miswak. Miswak, easiest sunnah. But smiling and feeling the joy 
bringing joy into the heart of a fellow Muslim, being kind to your wife and children, to everybody, it's hard. I can do it easily a thawb. Somebody brought me the thawb. Imam, when you wear it and speak, everybody will listen. I was not wearing it, but now for these people I am wearing it. I don't consider this sunnah of the Prophet <laughs> Arabs used to wear and Prophet wear what they used to wear. Prophet did not come to teach us. He taught us modest wearing, modest, modesty. Okay, we claim to love the Messenger of Allah, but we don't follow the sunnah. We enjoy the blessings of Allah, but remain ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, you claim shaitan is your enemy, but you are obeying him anyway. Shaitanic temptations, we follow him, left and right, because it is my life, I can do whatever I want, I can sit in Timotan instead of masjid for countless hours, I don't need to go to the masjid, it's my life, whatever, everything is my life. You know, when somebody calls you for salah, he say, I'm too tired. He calls you for a movie, you jump out of bed. You have all the energy in the world. Because shaitan, we know he's our enemy, but yet we follow him. We believe heaven is true, but we don't work to get to heaven. Heaven is expensive. It's expensive to get there. But we don't want to get there. And number, another number seven is, we know hell is true, but we are not running away from it. And number eight, we know death is inevitable, and yet you are not prepared to die. As if I am thinking I will live. Even though I am 70, I'm telling myself I will live up to 90. Or 100, na'udhu billah. You know, we cannot tempt ourselves with this thought that Allah will give me another day. So be prepared. And no sooner you are awake, you are busy picking the faults of others and forget your own fault. May Allah save me and you from that. Finally, you bury the dead and don't take a lesson from them. When we accompany the funeral, the teaching of Islam is silent. You know why? Because I need to rehearse my own funeral. When that body is lowered to the ground, I need to rehearse next time my body is going to be, you know, buried like that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save me and you. May Allah accept from us our prayers and fasts and charities. May Allah forgive us. May Allah bring us this consciousness and understanding to come back to the Quran as we should come back by chanting it melodiously, reflecting upon the lessons, acting upon it as best as we can. And of course, ask for guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May the Quran be a pleader for us because Quran can be a hujja for us or against us. Because you, you may read the Quran, well, Quran will anhu. There are many who read the Quran, the Quran they are reading is cursing them. Because Quran is saying don't fornicate, and they are fornicating. Quran is saying don't drink, and they are doing that. So you do the opposite, so the Quran you are reading is not going to benefit you. So may Allah save us. Have mercy on those who have passed away. May Allah have mercy on those who are sick and suffering. Aqulu qawli hadha. Wa astaghfirullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.